This passage of scripture troubles me. Troubles me for many reasons. Right? There's so many things in here that we try to spiritualize. There's so many things in here we try to understand. We try to make them be in a way that we can fit them into our box so that God will be who we need Him to be and that we can do all of the things that we need to do. As I read over this passage of Scripture this morning, knowing that we had a baptism, it reminded me of a, of a story that I heard once about Roman soldiers being baptized. And when Roman soldiers would go to be baptized, they would, you know, they would baptize these people in the, in the rivers, right? So they were fully immersed, not like us this morning, not that the not the not water we use matters. But they would be fully immersed. And as the, the Roman soldiers would get immersed under the water to be baptized, they would hold their right hand up out of the water. Why? It was their sword hand. It's the hand they had they used to kill people with. So if I didn't put it under the water, then God didn't claim it. And nowadays we want to get baptized like this. Right? You can have everything, Jesus, except for this. This is mine and you can't have it. Right? Because I get the medal today because today's text is all about money, so I get to talk about money. Not that it's easy for me to do that, but, right? That's what this text is about. It's all about money, and it's all about what belongs to who, and how do we use it. The interesting part to this is Jesus is asked a question. He's going away on a journey, and a man runs up to him and says, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And rather than Jesus answering his question, he asked another question. Why do you call me good? No one is good but God. But he overlooked the most interesting part to the man's question. What did the man ask Jesus? What must I do to inherit eternal life? So the next question then should be is, what must you do to get an inheritance. What can you do to get an inheritance? Say it louder. You can't tell me louder. Nothing. Right? You could go up to Bill Gates and ask him. Do any of you know Bill Gates? Oh yeah, I got some hands up in the back there. Whoa, wait a minute. But if you don't know Bill Gates, walk up to Bill Gates and ask him, what must I do to inherit part of your wealth? And what is he probably going to do? He's probably going to do one of two things, and maybe both of them. He's going to laugh at you, number one. And number two, he's probably going to get his security to come and get this nut job away from him. Right? There's nothing you can do to get an inheritance. Absolutely nothing. Right? So why does this man ask Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's like what he's doing so far is not enough. Not enough. Because in Jesus' day, having wealth, which this man did, right? He was a rich man, it said that. And keeping the commandments were the things that made you to be closest to God. So he was blessed because he was rich, and he says he kept the commandments, right? Jesus threw out a list of commandments for him and confirmation students here's your quiz for Wednesday night what is the commandment that Jesus throws out here that isn't actually a commandment one in the list that Jesus says is not in the ten but he throws out these commandments to this guy and the guy says I've kept all of them and then Jesus looks at him and he loves him and he says go and sell everything you own and give the money to the poor, and then come and follow me. What if I told you that Jesus was being literal here? And you have to go leave here today and sell everything you own and give all the money to the poor and then come back and follow Jesus. How many of you would actually come back? Because see, here's the thing, we've 
taken this passage of Scripture and tried to make it fit into our neat little box. We've tried to take this passage of Scripture and make it fit to the God who we want it to be. And it's been done over a long period of time. I'm sure several of you have probably heard that this is just a... The, the camel through the eye of the needle is a gate in the city of Jerusalem that would have a bigger gate and then a smaller gate, right? Have any of you ever heard this before? That there was a smaller gate and the big gate? I see some heads shaking. No, I see some heads shaking this way, though. But there's a, supposedly this gate into the old city of Jerusalem that was a big gate that camels and caravans could go through. And then as it got dark, they would shut the big gate and there was a smaller gate called the eye of the needle that you would have to go through. Well, a camel could not go through it if it was fully burdened. So it had to, the people who were bringing their camels in would have to unload all of the stuff from their camels and the camels would actually have to like squat down and kind of crawl through this gate because it was a smaller gate, right? That's a great spiritualization of this text because it tells us that we have to come up here to this place completely unburdened. We have to get rid of all of the things that hold us be that wealth is and riches or money or playstations or motorcycles or boats or you know, insert toy of choice here. Whatever is, is overcompensating in your life over God. You have to leave all those things behind. You have to take all of that stuff off and crawl through this gate to come to God unfettered, unburdened, completely naked as yourself. Right? That's a great way to think about this. There's absolutely no proof that a gate called the eye of the needle ever existed. It's made up. And it doesn't help us. Because then it takes the text and takes it from a place that Jesus intended it to be to a place that it's not. And here's another one. They actually created a whole new word in the Greek language because some people didn't like the way this text read. The word for camel is camelon. Kamelon in Greek. If you want to see it, I can show it to you later. But they created a word, and it's kamelon. It's spelled just a little different. They actually added a letter to the word for camel, and they made that word to be rope. So therefore, you could have a small enough rope that would go through the eye of a needle, right? So they made it to be, and actually it just says, there's the Lindell Scott James Greek lexicon that says that this word camelon, the word for rope, was made up, was created to help make this text make sense. Because we can't take it when we can't understand something, right? Everything has to make sense. It has to be black or white. Well, you know what? This text really is black and white. Because Jesus said, you have to be completely following me. Nothing can be in your way. And he looked on this man and saw that he was rich and that he actually had kept the commandments. You know, I don't know if it's possible for any of us to totally keep the commandments, but we can all give it a really good shot. And Jesus probably saw that this man had done that. He was living a good life. He's not a miser. He's not a a person who's hoarding his wealth. He's living his life loving others. But Jesus looked at him and loved him and saw that there was something in the way. And he said to him, you've got to come unfettered. You've got to get rid of it all. And if Jesus said that to you, what would you say back? How would you respond? Because here's what it really boils down to. The man came to him and said, What must I do? What must I do? What is enough to merit grace and mercy from God? Right? Wouldn't we all really like to know that? What is enough? What is enough? Because in Jesus' day, as I said, they thought that being rich meant that you were blessed and that you were close to God. And if you followed the commandments, right? Paul said that I am a Pharisee among Pharisees. I kept all of the commandments. Not one jot or tittle did I ignore. Paul said he kept them all. But that still didn't mean anything. Because it's not about what we do. 
It's about this right here. And we get to see it happen this morning. That's what it's about. It's not about what we can do because in the long run there's absolutely nothing you can do. In the short run there's nothing, nothing you can do. You could go out today and sell everything you own and give all the money to the poor and that's not going to bring you any closer to God. Because here's what God really wants. If it boils down to anything, and what God wants you to do, God wants you to give yourself completely and fully, 100%. And yeah, I'm kind of saying two different things here. I said you, have to, you can't come unfettered because the eye of the needle is not about us leaving all of our stuff behind. But that's the way that this text works. It's an enigma. It's perplexing. Especially when we take it back to last week when Jesus said, let the little ch- children come to me and unless you come to the kingdom of God as a child, you cannot enter it. And then he says here, unless you devolved all of your stuff, my children, how hard is it to come into the kingdom of God? My children, how hard is it to come into the kingdom of God? It's not about just those who are rich giving up everything. It's about all of his children giving up everything. Right? Because we can sit here and think, well, I'm not rich. I don't have to worry about it. I'm not even going to go there. I read a, a, gra- actually, I am going to go there. I read a graphic on Facebook last night. I don't know how true it is. But the point of the matter is, is if we're sitting here this morning, you woke up, you got out of your, your house, you drove your car here, you're in the top 10% at least of the wealthiest people in the world. Because there's people that don't have a house. There's people that don't have, even in our country, there's people that don't have that. And those people are still in the top 15, 10% of the wealthiest people in the world. We're all wealthy. We all have more than we could ever possibly imagine. And yet we still want more. But here's the thing. Jesus just wants us to come as we are and give him everything. Not try to hold anything back, not try to keep anything to ourselves, but just to lay everything out there because he's every done, already done everything that he needs to do to give us eternal life. He died on the cross that gave us away and then names and claims each and every one of us here at this spot. And if we allow him to use our lives the way that he needs to, then we're already there and we can't get any more than we already have. But if we can follow him abundantly here in this place, it's not about just having eternal life sometime in the future. It's about having an abundant life here and now. Because there's nothing we can do because he's already done it for us. James R. Edwards, he's a commentator, a theologian who wrote the book, The Gospel According to Mark. And his section that begins the the passage of Scripture we talked about this morning begins with this, and I quote, The call to follow Jesus does not constitute an additional obligation in life, but rather judges, replaces, and subordinates all obligations and allegiances to the one who says, follow me. Being a Christian is not a hobby. It's not one other thing we put in our plate and in in our calendar of things to do. Being a Christian is a way of life. It's not about another obligation. It's about the only obligation. Because for us, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So how much does God and Jesus want and when is it enough? That, that can't be qualified. It can't be answered. Because God wants you. So are you ready to give everything up and follow after Him? Knowing that it's impossible for you to make it, but that He's already paved the way.